So uh, just two quick things I want to talk about before we get into the uh, Sherlock Holmes story. Um, so uh, I distributed to you just now um, the assignment sheet for paper two. Um, so all relevant instructions and due dates are on the sheet. So just to give you in digest form here are the really important parts. Um, so first, remember that this is going to be a comparative paper, right? So you're going to be writing about two texts that you think are dealing with a similar theme. So one from before midterm and one from after midterm. And the text from before midterm can't be the same text you wrote your midterm paper about. So I think you both wrote about the mortal immortal, so just write about something other than that. Um, but you know, like think about like the kinds of themes that we've covered in the class, and like things that we've kind of that have been kind of these connecting threads, like uh, you know things like um, you know imperialism and racial difference, uh, you know things like uh, gender roles, uh, you know things like um, industrialization and, and economics, and you know wealth and poverty, things like that. Um, and yeah, you're gonna want you're gonna be comparing the way the later text deals with this particular theme to the way the earlier text does, making an argument about kind of like why that matters. Um, so you're going to need uh, at least five secondary sources for this. Uh, I have a list of the kinds of secondary sources that are acceptable. Um, plus, I've been giving you all bibliographies every class session, right? So that should at least give you a starting point um, for for, for this kind of work, right? So it's going to be double spaced, roughly eight to ten pages long, with a work cited page. The work the work cited page does not count towards the word count, um, and <clears throat> the main things that I want to get across here, right? Like first, the first part of this you're going to do is the annotated bibliography, right? I want you doing an annotated bibliography before you even write a proposal for this paper. Because I want you to do the research first and let that guide the argument that you're going to make. Now, have you done annotated bibliography? I know you've done an annotated bibliography before. Have you done one before? OK, do you know what it is? OK, so there are directions in the assignment. But essentially, what you're going to do is you're going to give me your five sources and you're going to give me a short paragraph describing each of these sources, right? Telling me what is in each of these sources and how you intend to use it, and why we should care what the author of this source thinks. Like, you know, what, what are their credentials? How do we know they're on the level? Things like that. Um, now, if you're having trouble finding sources, I know I mentioned last time when we talked about the presentations, you can always shoot an email and set up an appointment to John Wilson in the library. And I'm going to reiterate that advice for this, right? Spend a couple minutes with John, it'll save you hours of searching on your own. Um, <clears throat> the other thing um, I do want to quickly note. Um, I know that in some disciplines, especially in the social sciences, the norm is to summarize and paraphrase your sources, uh, primary and secondary. In the humanities, the norm is direct quotation. So make sure that you are directly quoting from primary and secondary sources in order to analyze, right? Because I want to see, like, not just that you're plugging in sources as answers, but I want to see you thinking about the source and how it applies, right? Um, the other thing, um, we talk a lot about history in this class, right? So, like, I promise, like, for each time that you write back in the day or some other vague reference to history in your paper, after I'm dead, I will haunt you for one year, right? So don't do that. Like, phrases like back in the day suggest that, like, that everything that happened before you were born doesn't matter. And it's just this kind of undifferentiated jumble of events. And one of the things that I'm trying to um, demonstrate here like, is that literature is one of the ways that human beings process the, the times that they live in, right? 
This is kind of how we make meaning out of our historical situations. So the, the specific historical situation does matter. Now, does anybody have any questions? Right? So you're going to do an anti-bibliography, you're going to do a proposal, then you're going to do the final paper. Any questions about any stage of this? OK. And if you do have, like, if you do look over the assignment sheet and you find you have questions, shoot me an email or bring them to class with you on Wednesday. Right? Um, I'm happy to answer any questions you have. I'm happy to give you any help you feel you need. And I do also want to reiterate that I give extra credit if you go to the Writing Center. OK. So if there are no questions, let's quickly go over the vocab quiz, and then we'll get into the Arthur Conan Doyle story. So, ignorance and want. Tell me about ignorance and want. Um, they were the two children that were with um, the ghost of Christmas present in mm -hmm. A Christmas Carol. Yes. Um, they played an important role because, for one, ignorance um, kind of symbolized uh, Scrooge's ignorance to like what was happening in, with the poor and it wasn't necessarily like complete ignorance but it was like a choice to be ignorant yeah like, what you don't know won't hurt you mm -hmm. um they were like these scrawny little looking things <laughs> um yeah, even the, illustra the illustration behind them it looks like factories and workhouses yeah. right yeah and uh they Um, the ghost of Christmas present used Scrooge's words against him to make him feel sympathy for ignorance mm -hmm. and want. Yeah, this is one of many instances in which he does that, right? All right, good. All right, the language debate in Indian education. Tell me about this. What language should be used to teach the natives in India? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's an argument over what language the East India Company should be encouraging um, the school, the, the English schools in India to be teaching in, right? What should the language of instruction be? And what text do, do we get this from? Mm -hmm. Minute on Indian education? Yes. This is the Macaulay, the Minute on Indian Education. And what is Macaulay's argument? What's his conclusion? That English should be taught. Yeah, that it should be, and all instruction should be in English, right? He argues for the superiority of the English language um, as not only a means of communication, but also, you know, for its, its literature and philosophy. Um, and also notes. His, his real motive here is facilitating trade right, between different parts of the empire. That's going to be easier if everyone is, who's trading with each other is speaking English. All right. Colonial Indian Exhibition of 1886. Tell me a little bit about this. Um, this was the, um, it was kind of like a, Um, there was like a lot of little pop up like things that mm -hmm. had like from different cultures in different countries like mm -hmm. their like kind of that's like represented like what they did there and showed the people in British that or in British in um, England that uh -huh. they um, like what was going on here and it was a way for Britain to show their like power and wealth in like a big yes there was also like the huge they like um mimic the gates of india mm -hmm. yeah so i, mean, I think yeah you, you've, you've got all the all the basics here yeah this is this this it, it's a great big almost like bazaar or fair right um which lasted for several months um in which Delegations from different British uh, colonial dominions set up booths where they showed off, you know, native handicrafts and you know performed native songs and dances and things like that. Right? 
And again, yeah, it is about showing off the, the power, wealth, and diversity of the British Empire. Now, what text would, would we relate this to? Is it to Europe? Yes, this is the TN Booker G. Uh, is it to Europe? Good. All right, Tiny Tim. I got my harp strings a little bit. Tell me about Tiny Tim. Um, Tiny Tim was uh, the kid in uh, Christmas Carol, mm -hmm. and he was um, special because he, um, well, one, he was a child, and I feel that children are used to make people feel sympathy more than they would for an adult. Um, yeah. He also did have a disability and he um, was shown that he was going to die mm -hmm. and when he was shown that he was going to die it kind of flipped the switch in Scrooge's mind. He did not want him to die and he was willing to do whatever it would take for him to stay alive. And yeah. Tiny Tim ended up staying alive but <laughs> right, because it turns out that well, what's the cure for Tim's illness? Um, what is the cure for Tim's illness? Money and decent living conditions, oh. right? That's, <laughs> that's basically what takes care of it, right? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, and the other thing to note about Tiny Tim, too, is that he's an example of the way writers will often use disabled characters um, as objects of like audience pity, right? When they really want to tug your heartstrings um, about you know, some particular issue, they will often you know, present a vulnerable disabled character who's being harmed in some way. And yeah, Tim's an example of that. All right, good, alterity. Um, this was a, this is a condition of like always being other, um, mm -hmm. this is from, uh, a visit to Europe, mm -hmm. and it's just essentially being, saying that like, wherever you go, you're going to be different. Yeah, now he's, he's not other when he's at home in India, right? right. Certainly wherever he goes in Europe. Right. He is always marked as different. In fact, the, the thing that interests other people about him, right, is his obvious difference. So yeah, he, he is, so while he's in Europe, yeah, he exists in a condition of alterity, right? Good. Goes to Christmas present. Um, this is. The third ghost that visited Scrooge, he showed. Okay, Scrooge. if you count Marley, yeah, that's yeah. okay, yeah. Um, he showed Scrooge everything um, from the present that was going on, but he was also. This also can bring up like the argument of time, um, mm -hmm. in terms of what the present was. Um, he. He, was, I, in my opinion, he was like the friendliest. Of the ghosts, um, he uh -huh. kind of demonstrated like um, abundance. Yeah. Um, okay. Like, yeah. In terms of, I mean, what he had shown Scrooge, what he had presented Scrooge when he first came mm -hmm. in. Um, he also did have ignorance and want with him, and he kind of finished his time with Scrooge by dropping the mic and really just <laughs> yeah. giving him his own words and making uh -huh. him kind of have to relish in that for a bit. Yeah, it's like, like that he's a piece of Yeah, like if, if we if we look like if we look at the three good I think I, I like that you're, you're kind of you're talking about um you know you're kind of showing Scrooge the present, right? You know um, if we look at the, the the ghost of Christmas past is trying to kind of like rebuild Scrooge's uh, sympathy, right? 
kind of rebuild his feeling. Um, the ghost of Christmas present is making him less ignorant of current conditions, right? And then the ghost of Christmas future is demonstrating consequences. So yeah, they, they, they are each serving a different function in Scrooge's emotional development, right? And yeah, I, th I think that you're right about where the ghost of Christmas present falls on that. Yeah. Continuing there. All right, good. Crown colonies. What's a crown colony? Weren't these the colonies that were under British Parliament? Mm -hmm. And um, I think Jamaica was an example of this. Yes. And they like weren't like ruled by um, England or the British Empire, but they they had definitely had a, like a British government that was kind of delegating what. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're, yeah. The crown colonies are, were ruled by a governor who was appointed by parliament. So yeah, they're, they're ruled. They are ruled um, more or less directly from Britain, right? And yeah, th this is going to be like the crown colonies have like kind of like the most direct British role in government of all kind of colonial types, right? Mm -hmm. And yes, you're right. Jamaica was uh, was one as is India after 1857. All right. How do how does the our idea of time change after the Industrial Revolution? Oh, that they, you could probably apply the Crown Colonies thing to either the Macaulay or the Mukherjee. Um, time. Our idea of time. How does it change after the Industrial Revolution? It was prior to the Industrial Revolution, they, people just did not really, I guess, take time into much consideration. They didn't really need to. There's yeah. a sunrise, sunset. Yeah, you, you follow your day yeah. according to natural cycles. Yeah. And then um, factories, the um, establishment of factories as well mm -hmm. as like railroads and trains had to uh -huh. kind of put everyone on a more um, On a better schedule, I guess mm -hmm. they had to start taking time into consideration. Um, yeah, you have to because of mm -hmm. hourly wage for workers and mm -hmm. then the schedule for the train. Yeah, these both require more standardized measures of time, right? So yeah, we start splitting the day up into into distinct hours, and. Um, <clears throat> We try to measure time more precisely so that um, train schedules are predictable. All right, and last two protectorates. What's a protectorate? How is a protectorate different from a crown colony? Um, they give up some like of their sovereignty. Mm -hmm. Um, in return for like means and health and that kind of stuff. It wasn't yeah. like they were just kind of being like controlled. They were just, mm -hmm. they would give them some, some control for help us, give us this stuff. Yeah, yeah, so the, the, these often start as kind of trading relationships, right? And so the, the protectorate agrees to give the British some role in either, you know, maybe in security or in commerce or something like that, right? They give over, they give up some of their own control over those things, um, rather than just becoming a kind of directly British ruled um, colony. All right, good. And finally, the economic motives for imperialism. Three big ones, what were they? What did they want to what, what, what did they want to secure? Raw materials. What did they want to protect? Too <laughs> 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 
<laughs> and what did they want to create? Market for British goods. Yes, very good. Okay. Off the top of my head. See what a little prompting can do? <laughs> okay, cool. So anybody have any questions? Okay. So um, for next time, we're going to be reading specifically about Victorian women's issues. So you're going to be reading the intro uh, to the, women que the woman question section in the anthology. You're going to be reading Sarah Stickney Ellis's uh, excerpt from The Women of England, which was a, what's called a conduct manual. We'll explain what that is next time. Um, an excerpt from Coventry Platform, Pat Moore's very long and not very good poem, The Angel in the House. Um, it's not a very good poem, but it's an exceedingly influential poem. Um, and a short newspaper article called The Great Social Evil. And that is actually kind of going to hook on to some of the stuff we'll discuss today, particularly in terms of the way uh, the character Helen Stoner and her sister are depicted here. But <clears throat> before we get uh, too deep into that, um, what do you all think of this? Um, so I've never actually indulged in like any, um, Sherlock Holmes, like uh -huh. anything. Um, yeah. I know who he is. I know the, I know the character. Yeah, the character is culturally ubiquitous. I know that there's yeah. shows, there's movies. Uh -huh. I know that they just came out with like his daughter or something in a movie, Enola Holmes. Yeah, his I've little sister like, actually. Yep. <laughs> I've seen like trailers, I've uh -huh. seen all of it, but I've never like taken the time to like actually sit down and read or uh -huh. watch anything of his. So um, this was the first thing I've ever read. <laughs> and I don't know why I've never like, why I've been so opposed, because it's not even like, uh -huh. oh yeah, I just haven't got to it. I'm like, I'm not watching that, or I'm not gonna <laughs> read that. I don't know why, because I really like like the mystery and like the, the solving and like, mm -hmm. I like, like movies like, have you ever seen Knives Out? I have not seen it, but I have heard You should watch should it. It's actually it. really good. Yeah, yeah. But, like, uh -huh. mysteries, and I've even read, like, other form of, like, mystery books, or, like, that kind of, like, suspenseful, like, yeah. you gotta kind of figure it out with the, as you're going, like, trying uh -huh. to, like, make you think about it. Like, I just read a book that was pretty much exactly like that, and it was, like, so good. So, yeah. I liked it. I liked it okay, a lot. Cool. Um, not what I was expecting. Okay, what what were you expecting? Let me put it that way. Oh, I, like, again, like, I feel like, like this is a character, like, we think we know this character. Maybe that's why we often feel like we don't really need to read things. Yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's like, ah, Shirley Combs, I know that shit. Um, I don't know, I was, I liked, I love how perceptive he is um, mm -hmm. in terms of like noticing like every minor detail. It reminds um, me a lot of the dude from Knives Out, um, <laughs> but he, I was expecting the, that, um, the stepdad, I was like, surely he's the killer, granted he was, <laughs> but um, that was yeah. not what I was expecting at the end, like I, I uh -huh. thought that it was just going to be like, figured out there was a way through like, the ventilation shot, or I, I was thinking that maybe he like, had like a secret thing through the floorboards that she must have missed, and he kind of just mm -hmm. snuck in and killed her, and, out he went. Yeah. And in um, fact, like, did, does this story actually give you enough information to solve the mystery on your own? So, <laughs> maybe for someone good. smarter than me, <laughs> but not for me. But I do uh -huh. think that, yes, it does, because at the end of the story, he goes back and he explains... I already knew this is exactly what was happening. I knew mm -hmm. this because of this, 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 and this. So I think for someone mm -hmm. else, maybe with that mindset where they can kind of just like right. figure out A, B, C, and D uh -huh. equals this, then maybe. But yeah. the, the, I'm reading it and I'm like, I wonder if it's like the floor <laughs> more. I don't know. I don't know. What the well, hell the, I'm the, about. The, like if, if you like, and I, I think there actually are some problems with the way this is set up, if you actually know anything about snakes. Um, so first off, <laughs> the snake that Royla uses to commit his crime, the swamp adder, right. doesn't exist. This is not a real snake. 
Um, also, the means that Roylet uses to train the snake. Um, yeah. You, well, one, you can't really train a snake anyway. And one of the reasons, are like, he's training the snake to follow the whistle, right? To respond to a whistle. Snakes have exceedingly poor hearing. So you actually can't train a snake using sound. Not a swamp adder. <laughs> you can't train a swamp adder to do anything because it doesn't fucking exist. <laughs> There's no such thing, right? But yeah, so like, like it's kind of clear that Arthur Conan Doyle doesn't actually know very much about snakes, right? But I think what's more important here is that you know, the story is actually set up um, as a kind of puzzle to be solved, right? Which I think is one of the reasons why um, detective fiction is often kind of lumped into the like what we kind of regard as like these kinds of unserious popular genres, right? That what matters more than literary artfulness is setting up an interesting and challenging puzzle for um, the reader to solve. And this is kind of in keeping with the circumstances of publication for this and most of the other home stories. So, Colin Doyle published most of his stories in a popular London-based magazine called The Strand. Right? It's named for a street in London. So The Strand runs from January 1891 until March 1950. Right, so this is, this is a magazine that's in circulation for a good 60 years. Right? Bless you. Thank you. And it's um, it's immensely popular, right? So at its at the at the magazine's peak from the eighteen from eighteen ninety one to nineteen thirty, it has about five hundred thousand subscribers in Britain. Plus another 150,000 in the U.S. So this is actually, like for a magazine in this period, these are actually pretty good readership figures, right? Like most of like kind of the smaller literary or artsy magazines would have had, you know, a readership of maybe a few thousand. And those readerships would probably have been much more localized. Um, but the Strand, the, the home stories run in the Strand from 1891 until 1927, right when the last story appears. So, really, like these are kind of, um, in the magazine's most popular period, right? And we'll see as we look at some covers that these are probably part of what makes the magazine so popular. Right, these home stories are a sensation. But they're kind of in keeping with the rest of the content of the magazine, right? So the Strand isn't, you know, kind of as, a, as I suggested, like a, a highbrow literary magazine. The Strand is kind of decidedly middlebrow. in its aim. So do y'all know what middle brow means, or can you guess what that means? Um, okay. I would say probably if we're talking in terms of there was a high brow as well in the magazine, uh -huh. it's probably like the, it's not like the most expensive or the best like mm -hmm. literature, it's probably like just below that. Yeah, if we're thinking of something that's high brow, right? We're thinking of something, not necessarily that's expensive, but that is for people uh, you know, with um, particularly rarefied, maybe pretty specific tastes, right? So when we're talking about you know, highbrow, high we're talking about you know, things that people might regard as like capital A art, right? 
with a great big exclamation point after it. Um, middle brow would be something that would appeal to probably like a reasonably educated professional audience um, who aren't looking for anything too serious or difficult, right? Who are maybe just kind of looking to, um, you know, while away a few hours with something that isn't, um, you know, isn't out and out stupid. So if we were gonna like kind of divide highbrow, middlebrow, lowbrow, um, you know, via like if we're thinking about like, like analogs and like say American pop culture right now, right? So like something like um, you know like a Real Housewives show or Jersey Shore uh, would be lowbrow, right? It's kind of designed to appeal to the lowest common denominator and to excite our baser instincts. Um, something that's highbrow, like I don't know, like maybe like a uh, like a PBS documentary on Renaissance art or something like that, right? Middle brow would be maybe something like Law and Order, right? Or it's something that's like, it's kind of like, it's kind of familiar and formulaic, but there might be some interesting twists and turns, and watching it doesn't make you feel dumb. Does this make sense? Yeah. Okay, so. <laughs> Yeah, or, Which is or, like what you're suggesting about Jersey Shore and the Real Housewives. Uh, uh, yeah, it's like when, when, when my, my wife puts puts one of those on. Sometimes, like, like if I if I catch like if I catch even like a couple of minutes of it, I feel like I need to take a shower. Just... <laughs> I know what you mean. No, I, I, I honestly I, I I believe that if there is a hell, Andy Cohen is going to rock there. <laughs> All right, but yeah, so that's the, so the strand is like the law and order of British uh, magazines, right? So the kinds of stuff it tends to publish are, you know, like quality genre fiction, word puzzles, um, and occasional but decidedly middle of the road political content, right? So nothing that is either intensely radical or fiercely reactionary, but like maybe just look like, like, you know, some like informational or, you know, everything is, everything is fine as it is kind of political commentary, right? So <clears throat> to show you just how big a part of the Strand's um, appeal, the whole stories were. I want to show you some covers of the magazine from its heyday. And we can also kind of see a little bit here how the character um, evolves in response to contemporary events, right? So here, you know, we've got, you know, a big, you know, picture of Sherlock Holmes in the corner here, right on the cover. Um, new adventure of Sherlock Holmes by Conan Doyle, advertised in big letters. Now here, this is an interesting one here. Right? So this is September 1917, and right on the center of the cover here, we've got Sherlock Holmes, out, Sherlock Holmes outwits a German spy. Now, um, what events or what uh, historical phenomenon is this responding to? This is September 1917. Mm -hmm. Too early for, yes, this is the, yeah, exactly, this is, yeah, World War I, right? So the home stories are kind of written speedily enough, right, that they often incorporate contemporary events. In fact, like uh, Conan Doyle didn't regard the Holmes stories as his real work, right? You know, he, was, he wrote these lengthy historical novels that nobody read because they all just wanted him to turn out more Sherlock Holmes. I think it's really fun. And here you have another great big Sherlock Holmes 
right gets in the magazine, new Sherlock Holmes serial, The Valley of Fear, right? So clearly the magazine sees the Holmes stories as a big selling point, right? You know, even from fairly early in their circulation, right? You know, here's at the top, Sherlock Holmes, The Adventure of the Norwood Builder by Arthur Conan Doyle, right? And even after Doyle's death, the character really kind of takes on a life of its own. Um, and still is, is like adopted to meet the needs of the current moment. So Sherlock Holmes in the Voice of Terror transplants Holmes from turn of the century London into the 1940s and has him trying to thwart a Nazi spy ring. So, <clears throat> the character and his activities and his, um, even his costume kind of evolve with time, right? And I think, yeah, we were talking about, about a moment ago about you know, those Enola Holmes movies, right? Which you know, now, you know, for a kind of, you know, post-feminist contemporary moments, Right, we have um, you know, Sherlock Holmes' younger sister, you know, going out and you know solving these crimes, many of which have to do with women's suffrage and labor movements. So it's in an 1890 setting, but um, speaking very much to contemporary concerns as well. Okay. So, was there anything about this story, like apart from the Holmes character, that seemed familiar to y'all? That seemed like, oh, I've seen this kind of thing before. Um, an abusive stepdad. Okay. Yeah, we've got the abusive stepfather. And what does this remind us of? Are there things that we have read in the past where there are similar sorts of characters or tropes? So we've got the abusive stepfather, Roy Litt, right? We've got the long-suffering daughters, Julia and Helen. And where do they all live? They got this, this crumbling old country manor house, right? So what does all this kind of look a little bit like? Think back to early in the semester. Crumbling old house with secrets. Young women being victimized by older men. Uh, don't say it. <laughs> I won't. I can wait. <laughs> Going down the line of my brain about everything we brought up. So, so many things this semester. Okay, so yeah, so this is this is essentially a gothic plot, right? Mm. 
specifically oh, a female shit. gothic plot. Right? Um, where you have, yeah, a, a, young, a young woman, although in Victorian terms, the Stoner sisters aren't actually all that young. Yeah. Right, you know, they're, um, Julia is 30 at the time of her death, and um, Helen is 32 when she comes and solicits Holmes and Holmes's help, right? But yeah, um, remember those female Gothic plots, right? You know, where um, a, like, yeah, a young woman's property or virginity are yeah. threatened by an older man, right? And um, in this case, certainly Roiland is a threat to their property, right? What's his motive for killing the girls or for trying to kill the girls? Um, if they are married, um, what's theirs is not going to be, it's not going to be his, it's going to be their husband's. Yeah. He's going to lose that because they came from money. Uh huh. He's going to lose that. Now, and to show also, like, that the, the amounts of money in this case are actually relatively small, which may be increasing Royalist desperation, right? So, the actual legacy that the girl's mother left behind, when she mysteriously died in a train accident, is 1,100 pounds, which in today's dollars is about 123,000 bucks, right? Not inconsiderable, but also like not a huge fortune, right? So because of the drop in agricultural prices, so it's now worth 750 pounds, or about $84,000. So just through the vagaries of the economy, right, these investments that Roiland is reliant on for his income have lost about $50,000 worth of their value. Now each of the girls is entitled to 250 pounds if they get married. So this is about 28,000 each, right? So <clears throat> we double this, we get about $56,000, um, which would leave Roylitz with about Twenty-eight grand to see him through the rest of his life in a crumbling house uh, with a leaky roof and broken windows, right? So he has a strong financial incentive to prevent the girls from getting married, right? Now, even the husbands that approach their potential husbands that approach the girls. Um, have strong financial motives for marriage as well, right? Because again, remember, um, if you reach 30 years old as a Victorian woman and were not yet married, generally how likely was it you were going to get married? Highly unlikely. Highly unlikely, right? But Julia, before her death, becomes engaged, uh, we learn on page 925, to a half-pay major of Marines. Now, half-pay, I think here, is the important element, right? He's not on active duty, so he's receiving a reduced salary. Now, <clears throat> you know, suddenly get an extra infusion of 250 pounds, uh, would probably help this guy out a lot, right? So his motives for marrying Julia might be largely financial anyway. And the guy who wants to marry Helen, if you look on page 927, right? Two years have passed since then, and my life has been until lately lonelier than ever. A month ago, however, a dear friend whom I have known for many years has done me the, the honor to ask my hand in marriage. His name is Armitage, Percy Armitage, 
the second son of Mr. Armitage of Crane Water near Reading. My stepfather has offered no opposition to the match, and we are to be married in the course of the spring. Now, look here at Percy Armitage's position in his family. Second son, right? Who's going to inherit? His older brother. His older brother, right? So Mr. Percy Armitage also needs cash. So we have all of these men in this story who need money and are latching on to these unfortunate twins to try to get it, right? And <clears throat> what do we know about Helen Stoner's status currently based on the beginning of the story? In terms of financially or? In terms of being alive. Um. <laughs> well, she's already, she's, she's about to be, she feels like she's about to be killed. Um, she's on the verge of getting murdered. She doesn't trust what's about to happen. Okay. She's about to be married. Yeah, that's certainly, yeah, the, the situation when she first comes to Holmes, right? But, um, and this is something that happens kind of quick, so you all might have missed it. But I want to go here to uh, page 921. The first paragraph of the story, right? This is in Dr. Watson's voice. All of these stories are in Dr. Watson's voice. In glancing over my notes of the 70 odd cases in which I have during the last eight years studied the methods of my friend Sherlock Holmes, I find many tragic, some comic, a large number merely strange, but none commonplace. For working as he did rather for the love of his art than for the acquirement of wealth, he refused to associate himself with any investigation which did not tend towards the unusual and even the fantastic. Of these varied cases, however, I cannot recall any which presented more singular features than that which was associated with the well-known Surrey family of the Roylets of Stokemore. The events in question occurred in the early days of my association with Holmes when we were sharing rooms as bachelors in Baker Street. It is possible that I might have placed them upon record before, but a promise of secrecy was made at the time, from which I have only been freed during the last month by the untimely death of the lady to whom the pledge was given. Oh, shit. <laughs> yeah. Helen's dead, too. I totally missed that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's one of the, yeah, like, you, you, you know, if you're not looking for it, right? Uh -huh. Particularly, like, the first time you go through the story, you don't see it, right? But yeah, it's strongly suggested here that Helen is also dead. And maybe, just maybe, given the way uh, men in the story tend to uh, behave towards women and their money, right? that maybe Mr. Percy Armitage um, <clears throat> wasn't the knight in shining armor no. she took him for, right? So in that um, time period when, so he, the uh, Roylet, Dr. Roylet wanted to kill them. Mm -hmm. um, if they were dead, is that his money? Yeah. As long or as was it just that they weren't going to give it elsewhere? It wasn't going to go elsewhere. Like, what was his incentive like, yeah. on killing them as opposed to just being like, no, you can't marry them? He has control of the funds um, as long as the girls don't marry. Um, so, um, yeah, killing them seems like an extreme solution right. <laughs> rather than simply... Because like, what know, would he get out of them dying? Yeah, I mean, he, he, I, I guess, I mean, he gets just unchallenged access to the fortune, right? Um, they can never then come back and make any claims on him. Um, and also, we kind of go like, what kind of person do we get the impression Royla is? Um, someone you don't really want to mess with. He kind of seems like a... I know he speaks very highly of himself in like a threatening <laughs> way. Uh, his neighbors hate him. And they don't like him. He kind of seems like super arrogant. He's got like the baboon and the cheetah. Yeah. Just kind of like a grade A asshole. 
Yeah, I'm gonna stick the baboon in particular over here for a second, right? Because this I think is actually kind of important to the, the other theme that I wanna kind of pull out here, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, he does seem like a grade A asshole, right? Um, we know that he's physically abusive towards Helen because the home sees the bruises on her. Like, you see, well, he sees that she's covering up bruises on her arm. Um, and what do we like? What do we know about um, the sisters' usual practice at night? That means that Roylott couldn't have just gone into Julia's room and kill her. They lock their doors. They lock their doors, right? They, you know, Julia. Uh, Helen says it's because they're afraid of the baboon and the cheetah, right? But they're probably also afraid of Roylott. I think that's kind of strongly suggested, right? Now, if we look at his physical description, if you look on page 928, right? The ejaculation has been drawn from my companion by the fact that our door had been suddenly dashed open and that a huge man framed himself in the aperture. His costume was a peculiar mixture of the professional and of the agricultural, having a black top hat, a long frock coat, and a pair of high gaiters with a hunting crop swinging in his hand. So tall was he that his hat actually brushed the crossbar of the doorway, and his breadth seemed to span it from, uh, across from side to side. A large face, seared with a thousand wrinkles, burned yellow with the sun, and marked with every evil passion, was turned from one to the other of us, while his deep-set, bile-shot eyes and his high, thin, fleshless nose gave him somewhat the resemblance to a fierce old bird of prey. Now, what I want to concentrate here on is the, the large face, the bile shot eyes, the thousand wrinkles, the yellowed skin. What do they kind of make Roylet look like? Combination of like human and animal features, yeah. right? But yeah, he's like he's almost ape-like in the way he's described. You know, especially like given like his great size and strength, right? Now, <clears throat> this kind of has two. There, there are kind of two prongs to this that I want to tease out, right? The first has to do with Victorian science. So, in 1859, Charles Darwin publishes his book on the origin of species. follows it up with a sequel in 1871 called The Descent of Man. Both of which cause a sensation um, amongst not just scientists, but in the, the public as well. Um, so what do you all know about Darwin's theory? Sort of, right? It's not quite that we evolved from apes. Rather, that human beings and apes, and indeed most animals, evolved from common ancestors, right? So, you know, if you look, for example, at fo you know, fossil finds um, across the globe, there are all these other kind of, um, kind of like sibling or cousin species to uh, human beings, right? Some probably precursors, uh, some actually having coexisted with modern human beings at some, at some point, um, that didn't make it for whatever reason, right? And so, um, you know, Darwin's theory suggests that over time, um, <clears throat> we select for traits in breeding that make it easier to survive, right? that um, a 
preacher that has advantageous traits is more likely to pass on its genes. And therefore, um, you know, will eventually become, um, you know, will eventually become like, like, whatever traits gave it that advantage will eventually become dominant in the species, right? So for example, um, a polar bear and a grizzly bear are biologically indistinguishable from one another except for one factor. What is that? The color of their fur, exactly. The grizzly bear evolved for a forest environment, right? Where that brownish color is an advantage in remaining unseen as you're stalking prey. The polar bear evolved for an arctic environment in which white fur is an advantage because brown fur is immediately going to show up against the ice flows or to anything if you're, if you're trying to like you know ca catch a seal for dinner right it's going to see you coming a mile away it's not if you look like everything else around it right so <clears throat> grizzly bears become dominant in one environment polar bears in another right even though they're otherwise biologically the same um, so this caused a great deal of anxiety um, in Victorian culture for two reasons. Right? One is the kind of predictable um, institutional theological reason. Right? If we evolve from earlier species, right, then it means, in contradiction to the traditional biblical narrative, right, we were not created as we are and shaped and nurtured from the beginning of time by the loving hand of God, right? Our existence uh, and our present form are largely the result of a series of historical processes, uh, biological processes, which we were, of which we were unaware and which we had, over which we had no control. Right, so that's the predictable anxiety there. The one that might seem less predictable to you is the idea that this could move in two directions, right? If we could evolve into higher forms, what else might we be able to do? Exactly, yes. There's, an ang there's a great deal of anxiety over the possibility of devolution under specific sets of influences, right? So if we look, for example, at the, uh, the, the, the moment in the story where Holmes and Watson are accosted by the baboon, right? Page 935, right? There was little difficulty in entering the grounds, for unrepaired breaches gaped in the old park wall. Making our way among the trees, we reached the lawn, crossed it, and were about to enter through the window when out from a clump of laurel bushes there darted what seemed to be a hideous and distorted child who threw itself on the grass with writhing limbs and then ran swiftly across the lawn into the darkness. My God, I whispered, did you see it? Holmes was for a moment, the moment it startled his eye. His hand closed like a vice upon my wrist in his agitation. Then he broke into a low laugh and put his lips to my ear. It is a nice household, he murmured. That is the baboon. So, the baboon doesn't really serve any purpose in the plot, right? It doesn't need to appear. We already know that Royla keeps weird pets. So what's going on? We have the ape-like Royla, right? And then we have this baboon that looks like a hideous and distorted child. What do you think is going on here? from the main plot. Oh, yeah, what, what's, what's often called a red herring, right? So, yeah, I mean, on the one hand, I think in terms of plot, right, yeah, I think the baboon is a potential red herring. It's like, oh, what if he snuck, snuck the baboon in there somehow, right? The baboon killed Julia. Um, although we also, the, the, there's, no way for the, there's no way for the baboon to have got into the room, right? Right. 
But I think what's going on here actually has very little to do with the plot and more to do with some of these cultural anxieties and these kind of like even the, these scientific anxieties, right? So Conan Doyle was trained as a medical doctor. Um, so this particular controversy would have been of interest to him. Um, so <clears throat> one of the things that causes a great deal of anxiety is the potential influence of overlong resident in residents in the colonies on British subjects, right? <clears throat> Do we get any sense that Roylett was violent and potentially murderous before he went to India? In fact, he seems to actually like fairly, you know, pretty rational, right? And makes a, a good and reasonable choice. Like, well, you know, the family money is running out. I should get a medical degree and then I'll go practice in India and make my fortune there. But then after a few years in India, he's convicted of a violent crime, right? He beats his butler to death because the man fails to prevent robberies in his home. So there's a strong suggestion here that what's happened to Roylet is that he has devolved out in the colonies, right? I think like we can connect this to some of that, um, like you know the gold, God, and glory rhetoric that we discussed last time, right? You know that that comes up in these discussions of the empire, right? That <clears throat> what the British are what the British are doing or perceive themselves as doing is going out and bringing civilization to these places where they think civilization doesn't exist, right? But there's also this anxiety that the process can work both ways. And that the British subject can become somehow infected by, you know, say, the tropical atmosphere. And then bring that back to England and, you know, do terrible things, right? Like, we know, like, what do we know about Roylet's relations with his neighbors? They all don't, they're all scared. Um, they don't like him. Um, yeah, he, he has not been able to reintegrate into British society, right? And I want to read you a quote from a book uh, by the literary scholar Edward Said. The book is called Culture and Imperialism. And Said is talking here specifically about um, colonial subjects who come back to the motherland and try to reintegrate. Subjects can be taken to places like Australia, but they cannot be allowed to return to metropolitan space, which is meticulously charted, spoken for, inhabited by a hierarchy of metropolitan personages, right? The basic upshot of this, right, is that you, you go out to the colonies, you lose your place in the normal social order, and when you come back, there is no place for you anymore. And what Conan Doyle is doing is framing this in terms of a process of actual physical and psychological devolution, right? That Roylet cannot be reintegrated because he's basically become an animal. While his little baboon is actually becoming more human through residence in England. Which is pretty fucked up if you think about it. <laughs> okay, so we're about out of time here. I want to give you all the, the guide questions for next time. And the stuff that we'll talk about next time will, I think, really intersect well with the stuff we, we talked about regarding the Stoner Sisters um, today. But do either of you have any questions? All right, cool. Are we still in the Victorian age? Yes, yes. I will, I will let you know when we are not. Uh, we're probably spending more time in the Victorian age than any other because it's so bloody long. Yeah. Because Queen Victoria just did not want to die. <laughs> when her son finally took, when her oldest son finally took the throne, he was an old man. <laughs>